everybody to uh, Phantom Whispers in the Author Interview. I, number one, I guess we're going to call it. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to need to uh, give a bit of an explanation of, of what this is here for those of you, because I haven't actually announced this on my YouTube channel, but for those of you who don't know, we actually put out an anthology series. We put out volume one of a short story anthology series called Phantom Whispers uh, just last month. So it's been out for a little less than a month now. And um, yeah, that's been out. And so accompanying that, we are actually going to do some interviews of indie writers and one of the indie writers the first one that we're going to do is actually a contributor to volume one of phantom whispers and that is raleigh nianzi now did i say that name right <laughs> raw nianzi raw nianzi okay so you don't pronounce the e. okay gotcha all right so this is raw nianzi and along with, uh, in Phantom Whispers, he wrote a short story called Memento Mori, which is actually an alt-history story about an America that has been taken over by the Japanese Empire. When I first read it, I thought it was about, um, I thought it was if the Axis powers had won World War II. It's actually if the Central Powers had won World War I, apparently. Uh, which, it didn't really kind of get into that in this particular story, but it was a a story with a lot of interesting things in it, colorful things. There was um, the, the Japanese Empire's taken over America. There were some uh, neo-Confederate insurgents or terrorists, and then there were ghosts. So there was a supernatural element too. Uh, that was Memento Mori in Phantom Whispers Volume One. And Rawl has also written um, The Perils of Sasha Reed, a book called The Perils of Sasha Reed which is a sort of sci-fi adventure book starring a pit crew girl as she um, in this sort of, I guess, kind of almost space opera-esque setting where she gets into a bunch of uh, pro troubles and shenanigans and it's kind of a little more humorous and light and tongue-in-cheek. Will you say that's accurate, Rob? So, well, slight correction regarding Sasha Reed. Mm -hmm. She's, yeah, she's more, she's more, of, uh, she's not on the pit crew. She's yes. more like the one of those ladies who Formula One had on the side of the racetrack. Yeah, they like... who Yeah, up until they banned them around 2018 <laughs> or so. The flag girls are the I, they're not called booth babes for the for the for race cars. <laughs> I'm not sure what the No, no, they're called no, they're called either pit girls or or race queens. Okay, yeah, pit girls. See, I said pit crew girls. I I meant like pit girls, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, so she's... yeah, that's what Sasha is. Though, yeah, although Sasha certainly has the technical chops to be on a pit crew. <laughs> yeah. So, so there you go. So those are, those are um, your two big works that I know about. Of course, one was in our story, but one, then I know he's Perils of Sasha Reed you published before that. Are there, is there anything else you have, uh, like, that is in, available to the public that I don't know about? Well, um, there's, a, well, I have, uh, well, I have a serial on Substack that's reaching its conclusion called The Venus Spectacular. This one okay. is more of a fantasy-style story. Oh, okay. Set, yeah, but with the twist that it's set on a terraformed Venus. Oh, so it's little, a little maybe like John Carter of Mars or like my one of my stories in the collection, which is uh, The Angry Blue Planet. Um, it's one of those kind of, uh, well, the Angry Blue Planet isn't really science fantasy as they've dubbed it, um, but, um, but, but, um, I, I know that, um, a lot of those, uh, like John Carter and stuff are those, those kind of stories. So it's kind of like that. Mm, so I'd say yes and no. Yeah. Yes, because, yes, because it's certainly, uh, yeah, because it's kind of similar to another story Edgar Rice Burroughs wrote called Pirates of Venus that's set on a, not so much a terraformed Venus as a tropical Venus, because, you know, this was before people really knew what was on those planets. Okay. And, yeah, but this, yeah, but mine is about a, yeah, mine is about the chief witch of, of the largest city on that planet, that city only contains about 200,000 people. All right. So it's a pretty sparse. She's population. going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Venus, yeah, it, it was like, it's yeah, like, it was only settled by like 
10,000 people at first, but that population over the course of 200-ish years grew to only about 250,000 total, 200,000 of which live in the largest city there. Anyway, anyway. Okay. Um... This story, yeah, is about the chief witch who goes to visit an old childhood friend in the city, you know, in a city down the river, but as it so happens... She not only sacrificed her infant child, the childhood friend, I mean, she's also built up a powerful cavalry to prevent her from, to prevent the chief witch from stopping other child sacrifices. Okay. So, so now the chief that. witch isn't, isn't sure what to do because as large as her town is, it's not, you know, it's not very well armed. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a, there's a bit of a, a war brewing, so to speak. Yeah, that's the main conflict of what I have up so far. Okay, and that is up on your, um, you said your sub, your sub stack, right? Yes, yeah, so yeah okay. the sub stack itself is called the Venus Spectacular. Oh, okay, I was going to ask that next week if it was just raw, raw Nyanzi at uh, sub stack or, so it's, so it's uh, the Venus no. Spectacular dot sub stack dot com, if I remember how the yeah, all yeah, all of it just runs together. Yeah. All right. Okay. So you're so you've got a Substack story, and then you've got your published book and your published uh, story with us. Um, by the yes. way, every, by the way, everyone, we are we are not recording live, as you've probably no doubt noticed, and that's because we wanted I wanted to avoid you know technical problems and just kind of. We we're just starting this series, so I just kind of wanted to jump into it gently. I don't know if we're gonna do any live streams of these later we might um, but also for now i've noticed that when we pre-record interviews or whatever or po podcasts or whatever on this channel it's easy for me to like insert in visuals and pictures and screenshots so that's a kind of nice thing about it um but yeah so raw um now that we've talked a little bit about yeah. uh, your stories can you tell us a bit about yourself could be light ex uh, life experience uh, when you decided to be, you wanted to be a writer when you started writing seriously and so on mm -mm. i i will tell you when i decided to start being a writer i actually remember i actually remember it very vividly mm -hmm. yeah it started when i was eight years old ah, okay you see i was watching an old looney tunes short right mm-hmm I don't know if you remember this one, but it's one where Porky Pig had to go to town to get some feed for his father, for his father's farm. This particular but then some huckster, okay. You, yeah, 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 but then some huckster sells him pills <laughs> that can change the weather. Oh, okay. I, I remember yeah. ones that are a little like this, but I don't know if I remember this exact one. I'm think I'm thinking of like a Tom and Jerry one where Jerry drinks something that turns him into a monster mouse. <laughs> but anyway. mm -hmm. Yeah, but it, you know it's along those lines. He yeah. takes the yeah he uh, he takes the pills back to his father, and of course his father gets angry and said, "I told you to buy feed." Then of course the 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 animals start eating the pills, and then you know funny things happen. And I do remember it ending with it like raining. Okay. But anyway, the point isn't the isn't the short itself. It's what I did. It's mm -hmm. what I did afterward. Mm -hmm. the, I remember the very first thing I wrote was just a summary of the short. Okay. Uh, it, it was about half a page long. Okay, that's an interesting way to start. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and then I remember writing something else. Basically, a timeline of some, yeah, of some, yeah, of some person. I don't know. When you say a timeline of some person, and, you mean like a real person, or you made like a fictional timeline of some? A fictional person. For a character. Yeah, I was okay. still eight years old at the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wrote like a yeah. Again, it's like I was getting my feet wet regarding like writing stories. Uh -huh. And then I would, and then, and then I would, you know. Yeah, and then I would write various stories that most of the times I didn't complete. You I know, think I we've all kid. been there when we when we were younger, certainly. Yeah, yeah, you know, I was, you know, I was, a, you know, I was a pretty big Sonic fan as a kid too, and mm -hmm. I, you know, and and ironically, that led me to start reading Redwall. 
Yeah, I can see the connection. I can see the connection between Sonic and yeah. Red Ball. They both got their animal yeah. people on, usually, you know, embarking yeah. on epic quests and things. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And for that reason, like a lot of my early stories that I've sadly lost, you know, were usually about animal characters. In fact, I'd almost be insistent on this. Ah, okay. In other words, I was very, I was very, I narrowly avoided becoming a furry. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of sounds like it does fall into that, that category, that groove right there, that niche. Um, yeah, I mean, I loved the Red Wall books too as a kid, though. So I guess maybe I didn't quite as narrowly avoid it, but you know, I was in that in that sort of area too. Oh yeah, um, oh no, Red Wall's great. <laughs> Red Wall's great. Yeah, a lot of fun. Um, by the way, so yeah. so your name, Raul Nianzi, um, where is that yeah. from? Because that's kind of a, a different name. Uh, from what I remember, Nianzi is yeah. Nancy is from I think I think it's meant to be a reference to Lake Victoria in Kenya. Oh, okay. That's the Kenyan name for it or Yeah, something like something like that. Okay. If I recall something like that if I recall correctly. And is Rawl also a uh, Kenyan name or is that from somewhere else? Oh no. Uh, oh no, that's uh, Oh no, uh, oh no, that's actually that's basically an anglicized form of Raul. Oh, okay. Because I, I haven't seen it before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of Spanish speakers named Raúl. Oh yeah, Raul is just an anglicized form of that. Yeah, that's interesting. I haven't seen the Anglicanized form of it, but that's that's interesting that it, that's what it is. Yeah. Wrong. So, yeah, my name's a little unusual like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. I just figured I'd ask that before we moved on because I was wondering it, so maybe listeners would wonder too. All right. So, um. All right, so now that we've talked a little bit about that, and I could I could compare my stuff. I started writing, being interested at write, in writing at a young age, too. Actually, I think the first story that uh, I ever tried writing, it was really turned out to be a story that I, my mom still saved because she saves everything, is a story about like some monster living in a place called the Bloodlands, and it's, it's, it makes it sound like they're <laughs> super scary. Well, so it sounds like it's super scary, and people are wondering what the monster ate, and then at the very end it says he ate cactuses. So it's like, a, <laughs> even back then, even back then I liked yeah. my little twists. <laughs> um, and I was like, oh, I was only like six or eight when I wrote that, I guess, and I was like, that holds up surprisingly well. Most of the stuff I wrote, you know, after that, in the, those years, did, did not hold up very well. It was like Z-Bots fan fiction and stuff. <laughs> oh yeah, in my, in my teen years, I wrote a lot of fan fiction too. Oh yeah, well this was even this was like my preteen years, and then yeah, my teen years, yeah, some of that too. Um, but yeah, but since we've talked about about a little bit about that and how you started, um, so let's talk about your experience since you know you kind of actually started uh, self publishing and you've worked in you know the indie sphere and the somewhat I guess somewhat dissident writer sphere. You know the people who are not really kind of interested in conforming to uh, the trad pub as the environment is right now. I mean, I know, I, I, I recall seeing a review of uh, The Perils of Sasha Reed on a Castilian house, I think it is, which is, uh, that's Vox Bay's publishing site, isn't it? But um, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about, um, since you've started self-publishing and stuff and kind of working in these spheres, uh, what's it been like, your interactions, challenges, and so on? Well, the interactions are pretty good. The reason why, yeah, the reason why I often hang around, you know, hang around that side of the creative space is precisely because I see the bollocks in the more mainstream spaces where, where extreme progressives tend to cancel people for the most milk toast takes. Like, I, like for example, you've heard of like some of the like some of the books, some of the YA books where someone just had some normie take on racism, right? Mm -hmm. Just, you know, you know, like, for example, there was one about, I think it was called The Black Witch, where, you know, about a girl who was incredibly racist toward, you know, other creatures, mm -hmm. and the story is about her overcoming that. Mm -hmm. anyway. Yet somehow, why Twitter had a problem with this because, well, well, to show someone overcoming racism, you have to depict them being racist. 
Yeah, at least at first. Yeah. That's... Okay. Otherwise, yep. <laughs> otherwise, it's kind of meaningless. Yeah. And I don't know about that one specifically, but I have... Yeah, I've definitely heard of a lot of this crazy stuff happening, too. I remember one where, um, like, an, an Asian woman was write, wrote a book where there was slavery... And then oh, I know. Yeah, I was about to mention that one. You know that one. I think I think one. it was like a black gay yeah. guy who wrote who wrote like attacking her, and then she like pulled it or oh, something. Yes. And like yeah, it oh, was just yes. kind of yeah. nutty. But yeah, that one in part that one in particular, I found appalling. And the thing because, is, yeah. <laughs> the thing is, there's a veneer of of politics to this, and like. Uh, I'm I'm gonna be you know be honest here. I'm a, I'm a pretty right leaning guy, so um, I don't like agree with these people on much. But a lot of it's not even really down to the politics. It is a veneer of politics, but really it's power plays. I mean, it's politics in the other sense, you know, of playing politics to get ahead, right? Um, yeah, they, they, because they... yeah, because trad pub slots are very scarce. Yep. So, so you want to <laughs> get ahead however you can. You want to pull the other person down. You got people sabotaging and, each other, people canceling each other, and it's all to get a leg up. And, you know, recently we've just had even more of that with, um, you know, people People have gotten caught, you know, review bombing other people's books. And this editor got let go because she said on Twitter that, oh, she read this manuscript where she liked the idea, but she didn't like the execution. So she was, like, straight up soliciting I, I saw that. other writers to write the idea of this and stealing this guy's oh, idea. Man. And it was like... It's like golly. Uh, that, that, yeah, that's yeah, th yeah. So you can see why I want no part of that side of you know. Yeah, uh, it's the uh, publishing industry. It's it's pretty pretty toxic over there, and like I mean, you know, you can you can argue that like, well, there's a lot of these workplaces and niches and stuff that are toxic in different ways at different times, but I think um, in this case in particular, it's become very sensitive and very cliquey. And it's all about maintaining control. Um, yeah, so so I definitely understand why you would feel that way. Um, what about any challenge? Have you had any challenges as far as, um, you know, I mean, obviously Indie presents a challenge kind of in and of itself. But I've heard that from what I've heard from TradPub, you know, a lot of books that they're putting out right now that aren't by big name authors, you know, actually are selling very little. So maybe it's not really any less challenging. <laughs> in that sense but yeah there. yeah yeah you see when it can't when it comes to indie obviously yeah we yeah, got marketing your book getting people to buy it and talk about it you know that's that's hard you know obviously and also a novel you'll notice that a novel does not have the same excitement factor as say a comic or a video game well it's the instant yeah, you know, um you know how people's attention spans are right now instant instant yes. gratification um and I think yeah, this is also yes. sorry. You you go. I don't want to talk too much over you. No, uh, don't worry about it. But also, my yeah, my point there is that it's that yeah, because it's novels. You know, you can have you know it again. It's not again because it's not as grabby as as comics or video games. It can be a challenge to get people to read it, get people to care about it, that kind of thing. That's been the biggest challenge so far. I haven't exactly been setting the world on fire. <laughs> well, people have, I think, yeah, more people certainly had, like, heard of you and heard of your book before we came along. Because this is, like, Phantom Whispers is my first, well, no, it's not my first thing I've published. Because I published a short story in uh, Anvil, Iron Age magazine. Um, uh, but, um, so that was like my, but yeah, very limited credentials for the most part, for most of us, you know, some people with some sub stack stories and like, you know, a short story here or there. Um, but yeah, I just kind of was, I, I had the attitude of, you know, like wasn't very satisfied with, um, the, a lot of the major mainstream zines out there for a lot of reasons. I was like, you know, the zines used to be like a big deal in fantasy, sci-fi, and really all of these genres, you know, Robert E. Howard, H.P. Lovecraft, they both published mainly in zines, and that was where they, their work was, and where it got discovered, and I was like, now, and now, you know, it's kind of this very, um, nepotistic cesspool in these zines, it feels like, so I was like, I, I want to do something kind of open, um, I want to do something where, where you know, people who are, are not in that circle can get a chance to put something out. And 
my thinking was, you know, well, if I'm not happy with what's out there, I should, what if I just make my own? And I don't have a lot of money, so I was like, what if we do like a profit sharing model where, you know, everyone, when every copy sells, you get some share of the royalties. Uh, that because I was like, I can do that. That's something I am able to do, and we did it. And I, I'm pretty proud of that. Pretty pleased with that. Um, but yeah, I was, and uh, and uh, and I like and I like what you what you did there. Now, now, mm -hmm. first of all, the term is zine, and second, oh, talk well. for a bit more. Yeah, talk for a bit more, and yeah, because give me give me a quick little moment. Just talk for a bit more to fill the air. Okay. Yeah. Well, I said I said zine because I always associated it with magazine. I guess magazine is also a zine, isn't it? Why did I say? Why did I come up with zine? Anyway, um, but kind of going back to what you were saying about you know people not people don't read as much, and you know now it's all like comics, movies, and TV shows, especially movies and TV. And one thing about that that I've noticed is that kind of people's standards for the actual storytelling, the writing, have kind of gone to pot. And I think that's because you can look at a picture, you know, or, well, it used to be. AI art is going to do some interesting things to this. Uh, but it used to be, you know, people could just take a glance at a picture and they could say, oh, that's well drawn or that's bad, that's good or bad art, you know. Um, these visual arts, movies and stuff, like you can tell if a special effect looks bad fairly quickly on top of being able to absorb it. You know, you look at it and you take it in and you can kind of tell if something's wrong fairly quickly. It's a lot easier to judge, I think, whereas uh, the writing of something it takes more time to absorb mentally and stuff and it takes more effort to actually figure out if something is wrong. And I think a lot of people aren't necessarily very good at that nowadays. And so there's pretty low writing standards for a lot of things because people are more interested in the spectacle. Um, that, is, that is true, which leads me to my next confession. Mm -hmm. Most of my inspirations have been, well, visual. <laughs> They've been mostly the cartoons I watched, the video games I've played. Now, I've read quite a bit because I read a lot as a kid, I did read a lot. I did read a lot of books, both fiction and nonfiction, as a kid, mind you. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I read nothing. Mm -hmm. But a lot of my a lot of my biggest inspirations in terms of storytelling and the like came from yeah came from the shows I watched as a kid. Came from the video games I played. For example, Sasha Reed. Mm -hmm. Her design is based off of. Okay, are you familiar with a? Are you familiar with a with an anime called Gundam Wing? I am definitely familiar with Gundam Wing. I was I was a tsunami kid growing up, so yes. <laughs> so was I. So was I. All right, good. All right, good. So you know. All right, are you familiar with? All right, so you then you know about the character of Lucrezia Noy. Um. Yes. Yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah, you see, Sasha's design was in part based on her, though Sasha's personality is almost 100% the opposite. Yeah, I was going to say, I did not get that immediately, and that's probably because of the, of the personality. <laughs> yeah, like I said, her personality isn't similar to mine, but her, yeah, but her design is kind of is kind of based on hers. Her appearance, okay, the way she's described. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, except you know, except obviously she dresses a lot more stylishly, whereas Lucrezia Noyne is a tomboy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay, so you drew a lot of inspiration from TV shows and movies and stuff, and I think that's uh, and video games maybe too. I think that's not too unusual for a yes. lot of uh, a lot of modern writers and aspiring writers. Although I do definitely think that has some uh, some pitfalls. Some perils, if we take a, a word from the title of your book. Uh, but um, but yeah, I think there are some perils to that in terms of uh, of uh, just the language. You I know it's not to... what you're. Su hmm? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I know. It's, uh, yeah, I know, I know it's not what you're supposed to do. <laughs> well, but it's what I have. <laughs> but you know, it's kind of what I have, and I want to work with what I have, and I want to tell stories. Well, now, I would not. I now more than. Now, more than a few times I've attempted to, you know, because I've seen the spectacle that more visual productions get, mm -hmm. I've attempted to try something more visual, but I will always return to prose because you can do things with prose that you can't do with visuals. 
for and like best like biggest of all is voice. Mm hmm. Yes, that's very true. Um. Yeah, I would not universally condemn taking inspiration from video games, movies, and TV shows. I mean, I think you can take a lot of valid inspiration from them. I just, I think the main issue is when people do that, uh, and then they write a book, and they haven't read much. Like you said, you've still read quite a bit. You know, you talked about reading the Red Wall series when you were younger yeah. and stuff. Yes, I did. Um, those are long books, of course. Um, I mean... I think I think the the problem is um, you still need to know how to write. Yeah, like you said, with voice, you need to have a voice, and you need to know how to use the language to depict visuals and stuff. And so I think that's where people can, can go wrong. But I don't think it's necessarily wrong or bad idea to use uh, inspiration from shows or whatnot, um, as long as you also have a command of writing and you know the sort of written yeah, storytelling. Yeah, and I think that you weren't the only one to do that. I mean, um, J.D. Savage in there, his, his story is kind of anime-esque. It's definitely kind of pulling a little from isekai tropes and stuff and uh, playing with them. Uh, so, so you know, I think that's fine if you if you kind of, if you, uh, as long as your, your language is right and your voice is right there. Um, but... Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, so, so, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily awesome. universally condemn that. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and you mentioned the isekai tropes and drawing inspiration from video games. As you know, there's a genre of books that takes this to the nth degree called lit RPG. I don't really mm. you know, I've only read one lit RPG book ever, mm -hmm. and I thought it was kind of good, I thought it was pretty good, if, a, you know, if a bit strange. <laughs> I have not tried a lit rpg yet i have heard of it quite a bit i kind of want to check it out even though it even though it like sounds like one of those things i'm like eh, i don't know if i'll be into that because i'm i've never been really into the uh isekai where the world is a video game um i've never been as into that i mean i'll accept it if i like the rest of the premise of a show or something i'll be like okay i'll, I'll watch it because i'm still interested in what's where it's going or whatever but I've never been... I, I like a more organic world, so I've never really been that into it. So yeah, I'm kind of like, hey, I but I do kind of... I agree. Of I, I'm, the, I'm the same. I'm not really a fan of lit RPG. Yeah. I'm just telling you that it's a thing that exists, and apparently it has its fans. Well, and it, yeah, it is worth taking note of, because it is, like, one of the few things we have recently in, you know, writing and novels and stuff that's new. That's like a big new craze. And I, I am kind of interested in checking it out for that and kind of seeing what it, uh, where, what it is and stuff. Um, but I haven't yet. I just haven't found the time. I've been doing other things, whether it's reading, writing, or a bunch of other stuff. Um, but yeah, it is worth yeah, taking. Yeah, and out. yeah, yeah, and y y all right. Now regarding now, now regarding the story I put in your magazine, the mental boring. Yes. There, there's a couple things you need. There's a couple things you need to know about it. Mm -hmm. One, yeah. One is that I had written a novel in the universe of Shining Tomorrow before. It's mm -hmm. it's even up on Amazon, okay. and it may and it says Volume One Shadow Heart because I thought I could turn that into a series, but I could never follow that up. Ah. Well, so for those of you, for I listeners, thought. before before we go on, for listeners, the shining to shining tomorrow is the setting of Memento Mori, and it's it's the setting for some of his other stories too, as you can hear that he he has written one book that's up there. But I assume you're going to tell us a little more about that. <laughs> yeah, that book. Well, that well that book. I only consider it a prototype now because. I have because I've spent like years since 2019, you know, re, just kind of recon reconceptualizing the world of that, you know, thing, the world of Shining Tomorrow. So you have and changed the, a lot of the features that you originally put in that. Yes, I have. I mean, the basic premise of the Japanese Empire taking over America is still there, and the Central Powers winning World War One is still there. But I've changed, but I've changed some things around, and what you see in Memento Mori is basically the new version of that. Yeah, well, I did enjoy Memento Mori. I thought it was interesting. With the it's, it seems a, like a fairly 
there's kind of a lot of moral gray in that story because um, I don't want to spoil too much for the audience, but um, the girl who's the main character, she wants to kind of um, get her brother out of the war and she joins this resistance group, but then some stuff goes bad with the resistance group and then in the end you kind of think there's a happy ending, but then there's kind of not. It's kind of, uh, I don't want to give too much away again, but it's kind of like a shaggy dog story almost. So, so it's kind of like there's a bit of ambiguity to it, you know. Right. I wanted, yeah, I wanted there to be victory at a cost. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I yeah, found it like interesting. A, uh, now, ghosts, because <laughs> this kind of stood out to me when I read it. Um, you know, most of the the premise of you know Japanese Empire takes over America is fairly mundane, but then you throw like ghosts and like human bonded ghost powers in there. Did you always have that in the setting, or? No, I did not. <laughs> okay. There's an interesting story behind that. Okay. You see, well, all right. I want, all right. I assume you're familiar with the Persona series. Um, somewhat, somewhat. Yeah, yeah. All right. Now, a lot of, okay. Now, a lot of this, okay. Yeah, I wrote this before I played before I played and beat Persona 5. Mm-hmm. All right? Okay. Yet, yet, when I was playing Persona 5, this was well after I'd written the story, mm -hmm. I noticed that, hey, the thing in the story, okay, except for the whole Japanese Empire taking over America thing, like, otherwise, it, like, it wouldn't be out of place in this game. So, so, but you said you played the game after this story. So this, the game was not inspiration for this, then. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was not. Okay. It, it was not. However, I did play a game, like, I did play a game that was kind of part of the same general series mm -hmm. called Tokyo Mirage Sessions. Okay, I haven't and played that And the one. Ghost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's a fairly obscure game. Okay. Yeah. But but in that game, like ghosts accompany like the protagonist and give them powers. And that's kind of where you got the idea that it would be cool to add in. Yeah, that's where I kind of got the idea. Though the implementation is very different. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah though the way I implement it is very different. Is there mm -hmm. is there something? Yeah. Did you notice anything about the ghosts though? Is there something you want to talk about? In Memento Mori. Yeah. Um. Oh gosh. Well, I don't know. There. Um. There. I mean, there. It's just kind of all. It's all rather sudden because you know it is a short story, so it's not. Um. So there's yeah, not like a so whole I'm lot of lengthy that. development. I mean, they they come into the story and humans can like bond with them and gain powers. Yes. Um. And it hurts the ghosts, but like because they're already ghosts. I don't. It doesn't seem like it can kill them or do them permanent harm in the story. Um, yeah, that's kind of what I got out of it. Um, but it, it seemed like it was, uh, it seemed like the ghost powers were pretty easy for the humans to use, at least in that one. Well, yeah, well, yeah once you get them, the ghost then generally walks you through it. But, mm -hmm. yeah, but, but yes, but yes, overuse of the power especially does, does cause the ghost's pain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I yeah. So I noticed all of that. Um, I don't. I feel like you're fishing for an answer here that I might not give you though. So you probably should just share your thoughts. Okay. 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 I know that we were talking in the Discord, but I'm pretty like. So I'm sure you caught the pun in the title too. Memento more. Yes. Um. Oh gosh, that was a whole discussion. That uh. Yeah. <laughs> a whole discussion that that people had. I I should scroll back to that. About the pun, it's a yeah. Play, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll just tell you. I'll just tell you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You see, obviously, you know, memento mori means like remember that you will die. Yeah. The whole there was a whole artistic movement in the Middle Ages. Yeah. Yeah, but but yeah, but the way I use it here is that you see, there's also the forest of memories, right? Yes, with the ghosts. That's where the ghosts are met. <laughs> yep. 
Yeah, yeah. You also have to remember that Mori is Japanese for forest. Yeah, and this is something that I kept in the uh, in the in the published edition of uh, Phantom Whispers. You put Memento Mori in English, and then you put it in Japanese. And I did keep that. <laughs> I kept the Japanese title repeated in there. It repeated. It repeated there in Japanese in the book. So. Yep. Yep. Because that because that basically explains the pun. Yeah. Um, yeah. You so... notice. Yeah. You notice the char- You notice that there's a character that looks like trees. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's good that you kept that because. <laughs> Yeah, because that basically, you know, explains the kind of pun I put in the title. Yeah, and I figured you wanted it in there since you included it in your manuscript. So, so yeah, I, I kept it in too, uh, even though sometimes yeah. it made the uh, spacing changes a little finicky when I was moving every, move, adding the images, especially moving everything around. Uh, but not too bad. Um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, the idea of yeah, the idea of getting yeah, the idea of getting powers from ghosts, you know, I you know, I again I just thought I just thought that would be interesting I just thought that would be interesting. But also you but also yeah, but also it's like here's the thing too. I've actually written another story in this you know, in the same setting. Mm-hmm. I just haven't I just haven't made it public yet. Because I still need to revise it. Because I still need to revise it. Well, yeah, I figured the way you re- the way you talked about it, it sounded like you're planning to continue this. Oh yes, yes. This is not. This is not a. This is not. Yeah. This is not the last you'll see of this of this world. <laughs> um, yeah. 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 I did yeah, think that the. Like, I'm, I did... a, I'm also. I'm also writing something for your volume two. Volume two that you, Halloween edition that you have planned. Obviously, this setting would work perfectly. Yeah, well, there's already ghosts, so yeah, it's it kind of slides in there neatly. Um, yeah, I did. Um, yeah, I did think that that was an interesting twist when the ghosts kind of entered, because I did not expect that from the the story as how it started. Um, but yeah, so we've talked uh, we've talked a bit about the story. I was gonna I was gonna t- ask you a little bit about your inspiration and where you get your ideas from, but I feel like you already talked about that. Um, I did. Yeah, so let's um let's talk a little bit about the you know the um other <laughs> the the hardest part, possibly harder than actually writing anything, uh, the marketing. So so let's share a little bit of thoughts about this. Now, I would say as a caveat that if you and I both know the secret to success, the secret to marketing, we would probably be selling a lot better and living a, a higher life than we are right now. So you know. What we say here is not exactly the expert opinion of people who have got it all figured out, but um, yeah, marketing. What are your thoughts on marketing? It's hard. <laughs> I do not know how to do it well. Yeah. So what did you before you did um you did Phantom Whispers uh, here? Um, what did you do? Because like I know you did get like I said I think you got like a review in Castilian House for Perils of Sasha Reed and maybe some other places. But what else did you attempt to do as far as as marketing? Uh, all I could do was tweet it out. Okay. Just not like, you know, like I have no real means of just of getting the word out besides social media. Okay, so because you just that's, because that's like mm-hmm. I just kind of tweet it out occasionally, talk about it sometimes. Okay. I mean, I don't, I, I don't, I don't annoy people with it because you know nobody likes that. But yeah, you got to be careful about uh, having the opposite effect of what you want to. I mean, at the same time, yeah, you know, it's like you don't want to be too shy. And I know there's definitely, there's definitely a lot of people I, I, I know, and I, I think it's a natural urge of a lot of people, especially a lot of writers who are not necessarily, you know, the most assertive. Or aggressive people, I think there's a, actually a temptation to worry about bothering people more than just kind of, you know, sharing and advertising. Um, but yeah, so you just yeah. tweeted it out, and then like some of the reviews you got and stuff were just people picking it up from your tweets, I guess? Yeah, yeah, it was just like, you know, just people just kind of picking it up and kind of liking what they see. Okay. But yeah, yeah, and yeah. Yeah, it's like, it seems like people who do read it seem to generally be satisfied with it, though I will say that I always have this sense that that it's like, I, I could have done this better. 
Well, yeah, I mean, you always want to be improving, right? And uh, and trying to stretch your <laughs> stretch your skills and refine things. And I think you know, at the same time, um, you got to be careful because it's like like Tolkien. Um, I know when after he published The Hobbit and it was a big success, and then he published The Lord of the Rings, and then he went back to revise The Hobbit. He said. He found a lot of it very poor, and it was all he could do to restrain himself from rewriting the whole thing. You know, um, Tolkien was kind of a notorious perfectionist. Um, but I, I think at the same time, you kind of got to have the attitude, and I, I, I kind of lean more into this lately, which is, I think, what's helped me actually produce some things, is that the perfect is the enemy of the good. You know, at some point, you got you to gotta have a standard for what's good enough, and then you put it out there. Um, but at yeah, the same time... Yeah, that's what I do. I just... I just put it out. Yeah. Now, speaking of putting out stories, mm -hmm. before you know this started, I decided to actually read a couple of your stories in Phantom Whispers. For, yeah, people were talking about Eska, so I read that one first. Ah, yes. You know? Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, it's like, <laughs> it's, yeah, I could see why people were talking about it because of the ending. I'm like, and then you just like, it's just almost a mic drop moment. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with all of my stories in there, but yeah, Eska is of course, you know, like the fantasy horror story. And I, and now for the next edition, I'm writing another dark fantasy story. So that's kind of a sub genre that I guess I'm leaning into a little in this, uh, in these volumes. Um, but but yeah, um, I yeah, I had the uh, the other one I read was the lost little girl. I mean that was just a short little vignette almost. But continue. Yeah, lost little girl was I um actually I wrote lost little girl for like a micro, not like a you know like a one tweet micro fiction competition like we have on on our Phantom Whispers Twitter page we have you know Tuesday and Thursday uh, micro fiction one tweet micro fiction challenges to just keep things really brief. But that was actually a microfiction challenge on Minds back before Minds kind of became almost completely abandoned. Um, but somebody actually put out a picture and was like, write a story about this in 700 words or so. And I actually added a little to that story before I put it in uh, Phantom Whispers. Um, but I wrote that for that originally. And I was like, you know, that's a pretty strong, like, short story, uh, quite short story. To, and I was like, I, I think yeah. I'd like to put that as the opener to Phantom Whispers because it's something that people can read really quick that will whet their appetite, hopefully. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think I think that was a smart move. Yeah, but as for Eska, um, yeah. But as for continue, Eska, yeah. that was something that um, that really was something where I did kind of think of the beginning and then the twist at the end, and that was kind of the first, and then you know just kind of some very broad details in between, and that was kind of my first inspiration for it. Um, but yeah, you know what Eska means, by the way? <laughs> this is a cryptic title. I, I, <laughs> I guess I'm not the only one who, who puts weird puns in titles. Yes, so, so I actually had a couple of different... I do not. <laughs> a couple of different... I, do, I uh, have no clue what... A couple of different I titles no I toyed with. Um, I, a couple it, of different titles like I toyed Latin. with for that one. I think the first one... What was the first one I put for it? At uh, one point, I put like bait or so. Oh no, changeling was the first one I had. Changeling, which is a little a little hint about it. the 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 story is for for people who haven't read the story is about a group of bandits who a couple of them capture this woman and take her back to camp and then things go really south because the woman is not what she appears to be. Um, but the first uh, the first title was called changeling. I was like, that's a pretty generic title. And then I toyed with bait, yeah. which is also a generic title. And then. Somebody else had a had a short story that was titled, um, um, you know, Robert had a short story with bait in the title. So, um, but so finally, I, I went I went with Eska and Eska. What Eska actually is is you know what an angler fish is, right? Yeah. The thing with the glowy, the fish with the glowy thing. So that glowy yeah. thing protruding from its head that it uses to lure in other fish, that is called an Eska. Um, and I actually. Ah. I actually uh, looked now, that now, up. Now it makes sense, especially when you describe what happens next. Yeah. So that that is what an esca is, that glowy thing on the anglerfish that's used as bait. Um, and it also sounds, though, kind of like it could be a woman's name, right? So Yeah, it does. <laughs> so so that was that was the inspiration for that title. And it's it's kind of cryptic for people, but that's where it comes from. Um but yeah, I think we're probably about time to uh, wrap it up. 
because I think we've talked about right. everything we plan to cover. But before we end, I want to give you the floor to, um, is there anything else you wanted to discuss or comment on? Uh, well, yeah, well, I don't, ha well, I don't have much else to comment on because it would require us going into spoilers for <laughs> both of our stories. Yeah, maybe, maybe we'll do it later. Um, but I, I feel like we talked about me and stuff as much as we talked about you, but this is the first of these, and I haven't really talked about my writing or anything on this channel before, so I guess that's kind of natural. It's kind of a double interview. I interviewed you, you interviewed me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I guess we'll call it now. So everyone, uh, Phantom Whispers Volume 1 is out on Amazon now. You can get it in digital or paperback of course the paperback copy is nicer in my opinion because there are pictures in this and because of how auto wrapping yes. text works um auto wrapping text makes it difficult to format a book with pictures and i kind of had to just space it out so that the pictures were at the beginning and end or end of each story with the wrapping text for the digital version but in the printed version the uh, pictures are actually at where the scenes happen in the story and it's uh, it just the, the, the printed version is a little nicer, but you know it is more expensive. The digital version is the economic version if you want that. But that's uh, that's Phantom Whispers Volume One. Uh, feel, please check it out if you're interested. You can also read the first like 20, 30 ish pages on YouTube on Amazon. Is sorry on Amazon is like a free sample, um, <laughs> so you can read the whole of Lost Little Girl and you can read the start of In Another World with My Tank, which is JD Savage's one. Um, yeah, so check it out if you can. Um, and this was Noel here with uh, Raw Nianzi, not Raleigh, not Raw Nianzi. Uh, thanks for your contribution, and I'll look forward to reading your next submission for uh, Volume 2, which is a Halloween issue. We are hoping to get that out mid October, like we got this one out for mid June. Um, yep, so. Um, awesome. So bye, everyone. Yeah. Uh, like and subscribe. Yeah, if you good enjoyed. talking to you. Yeah. If you enjoyed, and uh, yeah, feel free to comment. Uh, take care.